Did you know that improper disposal of batteries can spark fires? The disposal of rechargeable batteries in household trash has caused a number of fires on garbage trucks and at trash and recycling centers. These fires cost millions of dollars in physical damage each year and put lives in danger. Batteries do not belong in regular trash or recycling. Learn the proper way to dispose of batteries at GoRecycle.org. Brought to you by Fairfax County, Montgomery County, Prince George's County, and Covanta. Hello there. It is Eric Erickson here. I hope you guys are having a great day. The phone number, if you want to be a part of the program, 877-973-7425. I... Well, kind of got to go down the rabbit hole here with a story that is somewhat disturbing. Um, the National Poll says the story. Joe Biden has hired a high-level person at the Department of Energy's Office of Nuclear Energy. His name is Sam Britton. Britain is going to be the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Spent Fuel and Waste Disposal in the Office of Nuclear Energy for the Department of Energy. Now, we can't dispute that Sam Britton is qualified for that position. But Sam Britton also goes by the name Sister Ray D. Oactive his drag queen alter ego. He has worn stilettos to Congress to advise legislators about nuclear policy and to the White House where he advised President Obama on LGBT issues. He shows young men and women everywhere he goes they can be who they are and give them courage. He's been active in the drag queen society known as the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. He has been uh, critiqued for his role in the HIV AIDS crisis uh, when uh, gay rights activists called him an incompetent idiot. And he also engages in, um, well, teaches people, this is the delicate one, uh, how to dress up as animals, particularly pups, they call them, and engage in, well, uh, domination and submission. Um, and it, it, one of the hardest things about being a handler is that I've honestly had people ask, wait, you have sex with animals. They believe it's abusive, that it's taking advantage of someone who may not be acting up to a level of human responsibility. The other misperception is that I have some really messed up background. Like, did I have some horrible childhood trauma? He says, as he gets other men to dress up like dogs in leather and chains and do things. <laughs> Here we are. There's no question, by the way, this guy is apparently qualified on nuclear energy. But it's exciting to have someone, I guess, if you're on the left, have a guy come in stiletto heels and fur dresses to Congress to advise you on nuclear policy. So I'm just not down with a lot of the culture these days. We are a hedonistic culture. And by the way, this is not just the left, although I think the left kind of set the trend. Matthew Cottonetti at... Uh, the Washington Free Beacon has a piece today on the, on the ubiquitous rise of gambling culture now. Uh, we've got l drug legalization culture. We've got gambling culture now. Uh, we, we've taken what was Sin City and made it Sin Nation. Everybody can get on their apps and place their sports bets. I have a lot of friends who do it. I have gone to Las Vegas repeatedly. I don't really gamble a lot. I've, I have discovered it. I enjoy the entertainment value of playing craps, the camaraderie around the table. But it is, it's gambling. You're throwing your money away. And a lot of people seem to think they can get the winning lottery ticket off the either the lottery or gambling and make a lot of money. Uh, vice is becoming ubiquitous. Uh, thrift and hard work, Puritan values are now passe. They're now considered bad. 
Uh, why do we need an ethic of hard work in this country? Why do we need an ethic of, of thrift and saving money? I just, it, society seems to have lost its mind and every, everything is brash and yelling. Within evangelical church these days, people are yelling at each other. I'm still watching. There was that uh, story on the Daily Wire a week ago or so about Francis Collins and demands for evangelical leaders to account uh, for why they held this guy up as a Christian. Uh, they know the guy. A lot of them are in a Bible study with him or a book club with him or some such. They, they know his heart more than the people attacking him. I, I don't. I think the situation is far more complicated than either side wants to admit. Uh, everybody just wants to yell at each other, perform for their own side on social media, be outraged, demand accountability of each side. But why would anybody want to be accountable to anyone else who acts like they want to excoriate them, that they don't actually want accountability? They just they want to be seen as the one who's in the right. There is a difference between wanting people to account for their sin and just wanting to be known as the person who is right. Everybody's gotten very loud in culture about these sorts of things. I'm reminded the story of Elijah in, in First Kings, what is it, um, 19? Where everybody's out to get him. Everybody is out to get him. They want to kill him. Jezebel, my gosh, Jezebel and Ahab, they just, they want to take Elijah's head. Jezebel was a piece of work, wasn't she? And he got so tired he just said, you know what? I'm I'm ready to die. It's enough. Take my life. I'm no better than my father's. And he laid down and went to sleep. And an angel said, arise and eat. And the angel prepared him food. And then the angel came back and said, arise and eat. You need your strength. You're going on a journey. And he made it out to Horeb, Mount Sinai. And he was so upset, he just, he, he wanted, wanted to hear the Lord. He just needed to know God was still with him because everybody seemed to be out to get him. Everybody was out to get him. Everybody hated him. You right now probably, you might feel the same way. Everybody's out to get you. You feel like sometimes it's in your head. Sometimes, and I get this too, I got to admit, particularly when I'm hungry, I get it in my head. Everybody and everything is out to get me. And particularly in culture right now, you know, even on my side. So I've been writing about the, the discontent in, in evangelicalism, and I've got a lot of friends on both sides. And both sides, as a result, they, I, I sometimes feel like they're all out to get me because I'm not placating either side. I'm making them both mad at me for telling them, really, y'all are all going about it the wrong way. Neither of you is really exercising any level of humility. And in culture in general, particularly pop culture, humility is a sin these days. If you are humble, you express doubt, you apologize, my gosh, they come for you. And you can feel battered by all sides because you think you're doing the right thing you, based on your values, the way your parents raised you. you. You think you're doing the right thing. This is what I think is right. And then you do it and everybody comes for you. You're like, I thought I was doing the right thing. Everybody seems out to get you. Culture seems out to get you. If you're a conservative these days, particularly if you're a person of faith in culture, the world seems out to get you. And if not you, they're coming for your kids. So Elijah, he travels to Sinai and there was, there was a strong wind. It tore the mountains, broke into pieces, the rocks, but God was not in that wind. And then after the wind, there was an earthquake. And God was not in the earthquake. And after the fire, there was a fire after the earthquake. And in the fire, God was not in the fire. And you know, at Sinai, God tends to be in the fire. He was not in the fire. And then after the high wind, and then after the earthquake, and then after the fire, 
there was a quiet voice. A quiet voice. And that was God. And I sometimes think, and and granted, I'm a talk radio show host. I'm on TV. I give speeches for a living. I, I write newspaper columns. Not always the quiet voice. I mean, if I were the quiet voice here, I'd be putting you people to sleep. Y'all would run off the road, and then I'd get sued probably. And and if people would turn off the radio. The ratings would go down. I would get canceled. I, I do have to keep you company and keep you entertained. I can't always be the quiet voice, but you don't have to also be the brain biblical donkey. And the quiet voice is not the quiet voice these days so countercultural. You've got the guy at the the energy department now. He he dresses up as a drag queen and goes to brief members of Congress on nuclear regulatory policy. He wants to I'm sorry. If you're a dude and you're dressing up as a girl going to Congress and you're doing interviews about how you dress up guys as puppies and and have sexual relationships with them and dominate them and they submit to you and you're giving interviews and you're bragging about it. you want the attention you want the attention to be about you everybody in society wants everything to be about them sex culture in society these days it is all brash it is all loud it is all in your face Adidas the other day ran that ad on social media that showed women's exposed breasts it was a it was an ad for the variety of bras sports bras you can buy at adidas uh for women we make a variety for a variety of fits and they show you just just dozens and dozens of women's exposed breasts to make the point wait till the jock strap ad comes out everything is in your face and you know it, it's almost it's countercultural at this point to just be the quiet voice to not be the person yelling all the time on social media picking fights demanding your right, demanding others' account, demanding others apologize to you, demanding that others answer to you when you're not anybody that has to be answered to. You just live your life. And you live your life the right way, live your life the godly way, live your life as your parents raise you to live your life. And you know, man, the culture will come for you. People will pressure you. They will want you to, to be brash. And then the temptation is there. You want, you want to be on social media and you want to get attention. You want to grow your followers. You've got to, got to be a jerk. I know of which I speak. At some point, though, you turn it off. And, man, people get mad at you for turning it off. Like, you used to be. I, the number of people I know who accuse me of somehow moderating because I'm not the, the brain biblical donkey some people think I still am, that I used to be. I mean, I clearly am not the way I used to be on social media. They're, oh, you gone soft. Everybody kind of goes soft at some point in, in their life. You realize sometimes that you did things wrong that maybe you shouldn't have done. Uh, you apologize and no one accepts your apology and it it's off-putting to you. And then you, you, you've had your say. And now you finally figured out who you're talking to. And people get mad at you and they want to pressure you and they think you've changed. You know, I there are very few issues on which I have changed my position in 20 years in politics. I, I largely think based on my worldview and all the things I thought a long time ago are probably the, still the right things. There are a few things I've changed on for the better, I think. But man, people are like, oh, man, you're not the conservative. You're, I still believe exactly what I believe. You're the one who flipped based on politics and, and who you wanted to be with in the in crowd. Sometimes you just got to dig your feet in and, and say, this is where I am. And you got to be the quiet voice because in a world that is screaming, in a world that is brash, in a world that is sexually exploitative, in a world that is in your face with, with sex and culture and vice, the quiet voice that stands firm is the most countercultural voice these days. And it's the one ultimately I think a lot of people, they slow down and listen to. I had a teacher once who when everybody in the room would be really, really, really loud, the teacher would speak softly. And just speaking in a steady, calm, conversational tone that was quiet, the whole class would wind up shutting up to hear. It worked. It works now, too. It takes time. Some people get impatient. Some people get frustrated. But, you know, I think about that story of Elijah. The wind came. The earthquake came. The fire came. Surely in all of those things, that's where God would be. Nope, he was in the quiet voice, too. 
made Elijah pay attention. And in society these days, maybe the quiet voices are the ones that are actually going to get people to be sane again. Hello there. It is Eric Erickson here. Let me get to the phones here to Bob, who's been waiting super patient. Bob, welcome. Well, how you doing, Eric? I I enjoy your show. You you make me think about some things I normally wouldn't consider. I don't agree with you on everything. But to get to the question, and this is backing up some, I'm just wondering, or I'm not wondering, I'm upset that we, as the United States taxpayers, are having to pay for charging stations. Mm -hmm. Oil companies, when it was developed, that was, that was done by the company. Now, the other dumb question I got is, if we're paying for those charging stations, is the government being paid for the use of those charging stations? And you know, if so, why don't we use that money to pay off part of the national debt, which it won't hardly make a dent. In, but. <laughs> yeah, it won't, won't make a difference. They're, they're going to get us further into that. You know, I don't actually <laughs> know. Uh, well, if, if they're government run, then, yeah, I mean, the government's going to get some money here. But, you know, Tesla... I'm not a. I am not in the cult of Elon Musk, Bob, and I appreciate the phone call and your patience there. I'm. I'm. I'm not. Um. I. I think that uh, Elon Musk uh, is a very smart guy, but I also think that very frequently uh, the people have elevated him above where he should be. Regardless of that, Tesla already has a network of supercharging stations. In fact, you can drive from Key West, Florida, all the way to Los Angeles in a Tesla and have charging stations the whole way. You can drive from Vancouver all the way across Canada to Montreal. You can drive from the northern tip of Maine all the way down to Mexico City in a Tesla. You can. The government of the United States is going to spend $100 million to build charging stations in the state of Virginia for electric vehicles. There are 10,000 electric vehicles, and they're going to use government money to do this. The government of the United States never built charging stations for the oil companies. The oil companies did it themselves. And the government has never built charging stations for Tesla. Tesla has done it itself. It is important to note, you can drive from Mexico City to Bangor, Maine in a Tesla and have charging stations the entire route that the government of the United States did not build. You can go from Key West, Florida, all the way to Vancouver, Canada and have charging stations the entire route where you can fill up your car and make the journey. And they did it without government subsidy. Why on earth does the government of the United States need to get involved with generic uh, electric charging stations for vehicles around the country? Tesla's already done it. Other companies could do it too. Tesla saw there was a business opportunity, particularly with a bunch of environmentalists in the country who wanted electric cars, and they took advantage of it, and they did it, and they did it without the government building the stations. The idea that we need the government involved in this, it's going to make the charging stations even more expensive and probably drive up the cost of electricity because that's what the government does. It just doesn't make any sense, and yet they're doing it, and they would prefer that you ignore that Tesla has built over 30,000 charging stations nationwide and in Mexico and Canada without a single penny of Uncle Sam making them do it or paying for the bill. But yet, here comes Uncle Sam. Hello there. It is Eric Erickson here. The phone number is 877-973-7425. The Biden administration, Jake Sullivan, Jake Sullivan is the national security advisor to the president of the United States. And Jake Sullivan has just had a press conference at the White House. And Jake Sullivan is telling Americans to get out of Ukraine. And says uh, the United States will not come get you if you get stuck. That is Jake Sullivan. Do you have a picture of how many Americans right now are in Ukraine? 
I would refer you to the State Department for the specifics on this because don't I don't want to do it off the top of my head. There's basically two categories. There are those who have registered with the embassy and those who have not registered with the embassy. In the first category, obviously, they have a number, although some of those folks have already left and didn't deregister. In the second category, uh, we don't know because, of course, no American is obligated or required. So you can't fix a perfect number. He can't fix a perfect number, and he wants them to leave and says uh, the military won't rescue them if they get stranded. The United States under Joe Biden has gotten very, very comfortable with the idea of abandoning Americans. Now, this situation is somewhat different from Afghanistan, but we still have Americans in Afghanistan, and now there's more and more data about uh, revenge killings by the Taliban in Afghanistan and we're not working to get anybody out. Uh, you know, I've talked about this a couple of times recently on the radio, and uh, more and more people who have heard uh, me either through social media video clips or through listening to the show who work for relief agencies have continued to reach out and say this administration, the Biden administration, continues to be an impediment to rescuing Americans. And now there's a report out. I talked about this report. The Department of Defense released this report in uh, part. It says that as the military was trying to get people out of Afghanistan, there were incessant calls for help to get Americans out of Taliban-controlled territory that created competition for already stressed resources. The Pope himself called and asked to help get a stranded Italian regiment out of Afghanistan. And when the Pope calls, you have to do that. And then Jill Biden started making phone calls, demanding preferential treatment to certain individuals and groups trying to get them out. This is all in the military's reporting of Afghanistan and how badly it went down. There was a failure to cooperate on the State Department's half. There was uh, interagency turmoil. The White House itself gave flawed estimates on how quickly Kabul would collapse and Afghanistan would collapse. The White House wasn't paying attention to what the military on the ground said. Lester Holt asked Joe Biden about it last night. And Joe Biden denied the reporting of his own Department of Defense. I want to clarify, are you rejecting the conclusions or the accounts that are in the Army report? Lester Holt asked Joe Biden. Yes, I am. Biden responded. They're not true, Lester Holt pressed. I am rejecting them, Biden said. Can you imagine the media response if Donald Trump rejected a report by the American military on what happened on the ground? Can you imagine the reaction from the press if the Army produced a report about Afghanistan or Iraq that showed that the administration caused more problems than it solved and bungled an operation, and Donald Trump came out and said, I reject the findings. I reject it. Can you imagine what the reaction on CNN would be? On MSNBC, in the New York Times, they would be excoriating him. And here comes Joe Biden. The Army releases its after-action report on what happened and what went wrong. And part of the after-action report is so many people, including Jill Biden, started calling Jill, not Joe. Jill Biden called, throwing their weight around, demanding that certain things happen. It taxed the resources of the military. It broke down the comprehensiveness of the plan and the flow of the plan. And Joe Biden said, I reject it all. The commanders on the ground participated in detailed reporting to help the military figure out what was going on, and Joe Biden rejected it all. If Donald Trump had done that, there would be congressional investigations. The Democrats would have everybody from the White House on Capitol Hill demanding to know why they're disputing the commanders on the ground. But because it's Joe Biden... The Democrats won't do it. And for all of you people who said, well, we need the Democrats in charge because they'll give better oversight. Well, they're not now that Joe Biden's in charge. For all of you who were disgusted by Republicans refusing to investigate Donald Trump, well, guess what? The Democrats are no better. Now, I'm going to shift gears because I have something I want to talk about. 
Actually, you guys get to be my rehearsal. I get questions asked on occasion. I'm not there yet. My kids are 16 and 13. But I get asked all the time, eh, where should we direct our kids when they go off to college? What should they do? How should they get involved? All of these sorts of things. And I'll tell you, I tell them, get your kids involved in a good church. I mean, in all honesty, develop a church going habit with your kids. And when they get off to college, hope they keep it. I I think that's sound advice, but politics, you got your kids, you know, they're going to go to a liberal school and you don't want them to be indoctrinated. You want them to be surrounded with with people who are like-minded so they don't go wobbly. What do you do? When I was in college, so let me give you the background here. I grew up in Dubai, moved back to the States for 10th grade, and while I was paid attention to American politics abroad, it was a way to keep in touch with home. I was not really politically active until I got to college and started the College Republicans at Mercer University, my alma mater. Wound up uh, actually starting the um, Georgia Association of College Republicans, the statewide group. Had been the last president of the Georgia Federation of College Republicans. It it ended in scandal that was I was brought in to clean up. And the only way I could clean it up was to shut down the organization and start the Georgia Association of College Republicans. So I was the last chair of the one and the first chair of the other. It was awkward. But, uh, you know, republicanism is not conservatism. Parties stand for things. They have party platforms, but it's progressives and conservatives and libertarians and socialists and like they they have their ideologies and their worldviews. And where do you go when you want to be sure that your child, if they have a worldview, uh, is surrounded with people who share that view? So particularly in a college environment, they don't feel isolated and alienated. And I was very fortunate. I got invited to go to a Young America's Foundation conference. Now, there used to be two groups, Young America's for Freedom and Young America's Foundation. They merged. So now there's just one YAF. They own Reagan's Ranch. I've never been there. I've never been to the Reagan Ranch uh, to give a speech or to see it or anything. But Ronald Reagan's Ranch got bought by this group, and they do student conferences out there. But one of the cool things the group does is they have student conferences all around the country. Scott Walker, the former governor of Wisconsin, is now the president of the Young Americas Foundation. He was actually supposed to be on the show a couple of weeks ago, Um, got his wires crossed. He reached out and apologized. He was confused on the day he was supposed to be on and then couldn't make it work out. But he's going to be in Atlanta, Georgia tomorrow for a Young America Foundation conference. It was the very first political conference I ever went to. They did a Young America Foundation conference. Uh, It was on the north side of Atlanta, uh, the Renaissance Hotel up there by the Brave Stadium. Uh, And it was was so much fun. I had never been to a political conference before. Uh, Ann Coulter spoke. Dinesh D'Souza spoke. Cleta Mitchell spoke as a big lawyer for the Republicans. I believe she was there. Uh, A couple of politicians spoke. It was just awesome. It's like suddenly I'm in a group of people who are like-minded and see the world like me, which was not something I got on my college campus. And you could stay involved with this group. And the cool thing was that this group had such a large donor base that I didn't have to pay a penny to go. They covered my hotel. They covered my food. They covered the conference fees. It was fantastic. And here I am all these years later. And they've asked me to speak at a Young America's Foundation event tomorrow. I want to convey to you a dirty little secret. Some of you around the country who are listening right now have invited me to speak at your events. As everyone in my life will attest, unless I'm preaching in your church on Sunday, the moment I get to the podium is the moment I decide what I'm going to talk about. I just speak off the top of my head. I'm a radio show host. I do this three hours a day with no script. I I can handle it generally. If I'm preaching, this is why I like to preach. I don't get invited to preach very much these days because people don't like a political guy in the pulpit, and I get it. I I love to do it. It's more of a challenge than this because you really got to prepare. You don't want to. You don't. You know, Bible says preachers leading people astray. I mean, you got to take that seriously. 
but this I can usually talk. But I'm kind of nervous about this one because I haven't spoken off the top of my head in a while. So I, I want, uh, I'll give you all the preview of the speech. This is my, my very short trial run here. We've only got a few minutes. So I'll give you the nutshell. And it is to be sure what you believe. My preacher growing up uh, in rural Louisiana wrote a book, Be Sure What You Believe. And I think you got to be sure what you believe. And when you're a college student, you don't necessarily know what you believe per se, but you tend to have the foundations of your belief system in place from your parents. And much of the world these days on the right and the left is designed to get you to rethink what you believe and come one direction or another. And so I'm going to be speaking to these college kids tomorrow and I want to tell them they need to be sure what they believe. There is a presumption that you must be well-read and read all the books. Read your Hayek. Read your Russell Kirk. Read your John Locke. Read your Milton Friedman. Read your Adam Smith. And be sure what you believe by reading the great books. And there's some truth to that. You get challenged with ideas. They can open your mind to ideas. But also, be sure what you believe in general. Because you're going to get challenged in the world on what you believe. And you may go wobbly. And it's okay if you go wobbly, but if you don't have the intellectual framework by which you can stop the wobble, you're going to fall over. Everybody goes wobbly a little bit in life on stuff. Nobody can stand firm. You're not the immovable object colliding with the unstoppable force. You're just a person. But what you believe and how you believe and how you advance your ideas is really important because we live in a day and of age of postmodernism. We live in an age where people don't want to know what's true. They want their beliefs affirmed. They want to feel good about what they already believe. But what if you believe something that's wrong or bad or harmful? Can you be persuaded you're wrong? What I have found, one of the secrets of life, is you should be willing to be persuaded you're wrong, and you should never be so dogmatic in your beliefs that you cannot be persuaded. You should be willing to entertain contrary ideas so that you can understand the ideas of your opponents and grapple with your own ideas and see what works. And you should be able to develop a worldview. And in that worldview, over time in life, you should be able to say that my worldview explains what's going on in the world, and I see the world through the lens of my worldview. And so I'm not taken by surprise often because of the way these work, the way the li world works, the way life works. And ultimately, for me, my worldview is the worldview of Scripture, that we live in a fallen world, there is sin and heaven and a hell, and we can't redeem ourselves, we need a redeemer. That's my worldview, that's how I see the world. I'm a conservative because I'm a Christian. Because I'm a Christian, I know every one of us is a sinner. And as a result, I want as few in charge of me as possible. That's why I'm a conservative. And I'm never disappointed because my worldview tends to explain the way the world works. But when you're a high school student and when you're a college student, you are developing your worldview and you can be guided by the great books. It's one reason so many colleges are these days hostile to great books programs because you engage in the great books program and the ideas of old, you tend to become a little more conservative than you otherwise were. You have an idea of conserving knowledge and wisdom. And the left has no sense of history. The more you learn your sense of history, the more you realize that your conservative worldview, particularly a Christian conservative worldview, has a way of processing the ideas and events of the world in a way that makes all of them understandable in some way that with the left, they can blow with the wind. But more and more people on the right, particularly the post-Christian right, are very much the same way. They're in the here and now. They want to they wanna own the left. But what does owning the left look like? Sometimes it's embracing the left's ideas and going with them with gusto. And that's unstable. That's that's not a way to change the world for the better. That's just a way to change part of the world and actually change it for the worst. So you got to be sure what you believe. You've got to refine your views, taking in additional information over time and seeing if they still align. And if they don't, you got to change a little bit. But 
you got to remember this. Ultimately, at the end of the day, there is such a thing as truth, and there are facts. And sometimes those facts may work against you, but if you actually know what you believe, you can be, encounter facts contrary and have them not blow you over. Too many people these days on both sides, they don't actually have a presuppositional worldview, and every fact is treated as new, and every fact makes them change course. And when you're changing course constantly based on new facts, you can't be steady, and if your world isn't steady, your world collapses. That's why we require stability in our world and stability in our governance and in our stability in our courts and legal system. Otherwise, if everything changes every two years on an election, well, the world becomes ungovernable, and that, frankly, I think is kind of what the left wants, so they can tear it down and build something new, and that would be even more temporary than what we have. you got to be sure what you believe. And I believe in the Eden Pure Thunderstorm. It is an air purifier that cleans the air. It wipes out odors. It doesn't mask odors. So many of the products out there these days mask odors. They don't eliminate the odors. The Eden Pure Thunderstorm eliminates the odors. And it also gets rid of the bacteria, the mildew, the mold floating around in the air. What you can do is go to EdenPureDeals.com and you can buy one, get one free. In fact, they're going to extend this. So you can go do your BOGO now. Uh, you go to EdenPureDeals.com. You'll see the discount code on the front page and you put Eric BOGO in, E-R-I-C-K-B-O-G-O. You do that, and you buy one, you get one for free. The Eden Pure Thunderstorm cleans the air, saves you money, actually works. It doesn't mask the odor. It eliminates them. The website, EdenPureDeals.com. At checkout, you use the discount code Eric Bogo, E-R-I-C-K-B-O-G-O, and you'll buy one and get one for free. This hour of the program brought to you by First Liberty Building and Loan Nationwide. If you're in charge of the finances of a business and you need to grow that business with a loan, reach out to First Liberty. Big deals, though, $750,000 and up, they can help you with. Uh, they want to help you grow. They've been doing this since the 90s. FirstLibertyGA.com is their website. They can help you nationwide. I feel the need here at the end of the program to apologize to any of you who were um, had moments of silence on the air earlier. There's some nationwide technical blip, and I don't know what it was, but Twitter went out, our satellite uh, connection went out, uh, and then suddenly everything came back. Um, so something happened out there in the, maybe it was the solar flares. I have no idea, but uh, some of you missed my Super Bowl pick. And it is, I, in the tradition of Rush Limbaugh, I feel like I got to keep it going. The environmental wacko pick, it's got to be the Rams because you know the Bengal Tigers they're meat-eating. They may be dangerous. They may be endangered, but they're meat-eating, and they're Southeast Asians, and the environmentalists, they don't like those Asians. Uh, they want to keep them out of Harvard and want to punish them for polluting, so it's got to be the Rams. And, of course, the Rams, they're vegetarians, too, and, I mean, they're coastal. They're coastal elite. So I think the Rams probably win the Super Bowl in the environmental wacko pick, even though I got to root for Joe Burrow and the Bengals to make history. We'll see. I wish them luck. I'm not going to hold my breath. It's 2022. Things are still crazy. Things haven't settled down. And now you got the Federal Reserve and interest rates. You got the economy. You got inflation. A lot of banks won't even return your phone call. Let's say you're a small business and you need a loan for $750,000 or higher. You see an opportunity where banks, they don't even want to see you. You want to buy a building. You want to build a building reach out to the Frost family at First Liberty Building and Loan. They've been helping small businesses become big businesses since the 1990s. They want to help you if they can. So spend 10 minutes with them. See if you're a good fit for them and they're a good fit for you. Their website is firstlibertyga.com. That's firstlibertyga.com. Again, you need a loan, $750,000 or higher. You're a small business and you see an opportunity to grow. Share it with the Frost family and see if they can help you. FirstLibertyGA.com. That's FirstLibertyGA.com. First Liberty Building and Loan can help businesses nationwide become bigger businesses. The regular season is heating up. New stars are emerging, and that means more opportunities to win up to 25 times your cash on prize picks. The most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection on a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's that easy. 
Let it fly to turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Watch your favorite players and get paid doing it this basketball season. See your entries make progress during the game or make new entries for the second half in the fourth quarter. Three pointers, assists, rebounds, and everything in between are yours for the taking. Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less, it's that easy.